Welcome uh, to the first Science and Conservation event of 2023. I'm extremely pleased to be hosting this event. Uh, really great to welcome everybody back uh, from the Christmas break. Uh, my name is Rachel Jones. I am the Program Manager for the Bertarelli Foundation's Marine Science Program in the Conservation and Policy Department here at ZSL. Uh, and I'm going to be chairing tonight's event, Saving Coral Reefs, One Species at a Time. Um, apologies from Dr. Catherine Head, who was supposed to be hosting the event this evening. She's not well, so we all wish her all the best. But I'm very happy to let her do all the heavy lifting in preparing the event, and I just come in at the last minute and take all the glory. That's, that's fine with me. It's also a huge personal pleasure to be presenting tonight's event. Not only am I a huge coral enthusiast, but the panel are all friends and colleagues of many years standing, so it's, it's a genuine joy to be able to, to introduce them. Um, the brief format of the evening is three presentations from our speakers, followed by a Q&A panel session where you get the chance to ask questions. I may squeeze in the old question as we go through as well, as we've got quite a bit of time. Okay, so with those formalities uh, overdue, um, I will start with my opening slides, please. I have been at ZSL for many, many years, and the one uh, sort of consistent theme through my time here has been corals, uh, working in different departments with different staff over many decades and many different projects. Corals have been the theme that have, have tied uh, my work together. Um, and I think ZSL has been working on corals independently of me uh, for, for many, many years. Um, I just wanted to give uh, a quick overview of what some of the different departments in ZSL are doing. This is Catherine Head's work. Uh, she has been using the Chagos Archipelago as a case study, starting to look at recovery of coral reefs from the massive, uh, tr uh, 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 incredibly damaging bleaching effect in 2015 and 2016. Um, the heat anomalies there wiped out reefs across the world, across the Indian Ocean in particular. Chagos Archipelago was no exception to that. Um, and the huge mortality really left a blank slate from which scientists were able to study uh, recovery. The key to recovery on coral reefs is, of course, how well connected they are to other coral reefs where corals may have sur survived. And this is a slide showing some of the population genomics that Cat Head has done. Uh, she's done it on three, three species, but this shows the results from a species called Acropora tenuis. And these, these show different populations of Acropora tenuis across the central and western Indian Ocean with three uh, different um, uh, strains in purple, blue, and orange. The purple strain mainly being found in the Western Indian Ocean, but popping up here and there in the, across the Chagos Archipelago. But the blue and the orange strains being found really well distributed across this enormous area of the Indian Ocean Basin. And this is good news for reef resilience because this means studying corals um, genomically at the population level enables us to understand how they link together and how they might uh, recover. In my department, C&P, the EDGE program has been running for many, many years and has produced many coral fellows. So this is a program of work um, supporting financial support, uh, mentoring, training for early career conservationists, um, all of whom pick an EDGE species as their focal piece of research. Um, and over since 2011, we've had 10 EDGE coral fellows studying 15 edge coral species and really focusing in on those species as flagships for broader conservation activities in their communities. Uh, it's been a really successful program. And not forgetting the animal department where I started, the fantastic uh, coral reef exhibit, which if you haven't seen it, please go and, go and see it. There are 75 species of corals there, all of them customs confiscated under CITES uh, legislation. So it's an incredible um, team working there and Paul Pierce Kelly leads them and is working on other initiatives such as uh, Mary Hagedorn's group at Smith the Smithsonian Institute looking at the cryopreservation of coral tissues to create tissue archives um, into the future. So I think ZSL has been working as I say uh, for many many years on many levels um, with corals uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome our panel here this evening. I think what these guys and I have in common is a real interest in the coral as an animal, not just as 
the reef, the ecosystem, the background, but as an individual animal um, and, and the fascination that the characteristics of each of these species have. There's the aggressive, angry ones that seem to fight with everybody. There's the easygoing, I'll grow anywhere, low key ones. They really have very different characteristics and it's understanding those characteristics that really informs conservation efforts to do some of the hands-on conservation techniques um, such as assisted breeding, such as supplementation, some of these conservation techniques that we apply to other animal species, but corals are really tricky. Um, so understanding their biology is the first big step and treating them as individual species. So I think that's where we start our presentations this evening is, is viewing uh, animals as individual species and understanding their biology. So um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, Dr. Jamie Craggs is a, an old friend. Jamie, Jamie and I were coral aquarists coming up through the ranks many, many years ago. Um, he is the principal aquarium curator at the Horniman Museum, which is a fantastic place to visit. Please go and, go and see the, uh, the aquarium there. And co-founder of Coral Spawning Labs. Uh, his research has been many fantastic years of understanding the reproductive biology of, uh, of reef-building corals. Uh, and he's been building incredible systems that in, in which he can predict and control the reproductive activity of corals, which has been a mystery for so long. He's totally coral obsessed, I can vouch for that. Having a, a coral spawning system in his, in his kitchen uh, that he uses to, uh, to instruct his, his sons with. So yeah, a, an old friend and a fantastic speaker. So please welcome Jamie Craggs. Can you hear me? Yeah, excellent. So um, I'm going to cheat a little bit because we were supposed to just focus on one species and saving coral reefs at a time, uh, focusing on one species. I'm going to use um, the ex situ spawning, but uh, focus on three different species and how we're using ex situ spawning uh, in different ways, uh, using three species as an example. So, and it's highlighting sort of the decade of work um, developing the techniques and the tools to spawn corals in a predictable way. And once we can do that, we use that as a platform for research, for developing new uh, methods for sustainable agriculture, so creating alternative livelihood uh, developments, and then also for reef restoration tools. So, why are we focusing on corals? There's always got to be a why for any uh, research project. What we know is coral reefs are globally a really important habitat. They're the most diverse habitat in our oceans. Um, and it's the corals themselves that build the structure, the three-dimensional structure that is the reef itself. Uh, there we go. So, Corals uh, grow in many different shapes and sizes, and that, that diversity allows a huge explosion of life to occur on coral reefs. So really the corals are a bit like the buildings of a city. They create that three-dimensional structure, the niche habitats, that allows all of this incredible life to occur on reefs. They cover a really small percentage of the ocean floor, about 0.1% of the ocean floor, but around a quarter of all species reside in these really important habitats. So biologically, very, very important. They're also really important from a human perspective as well. Um, an estimated uh, 500 million people rely on corals, uh, either directly or indirectly around the world. So very important from a human perspective as well. This picture was taken, the central picture, in 2013 in Guam, and that's what it looked like one year later, the same location. So we can see the degradation that's happened in a single year. When we lose the reef, we lose all of this associated life. Um, so you get this sort of disproportionate loss of biodiversity if the corals themselves are threatened. This is unfortunately the type of uh, habitat that you can see in many locations now. So this was shot in 2003 uh, out in Borneo, and this is five years after a major bleaching event completely destroyed this reef. So the reef, the three-dimensional structure has, has died, it's broken, become brittle, and then we've got a very two-dimensional structure, and you can see very few fish um, now associated with that. Now this reef can recover. Uh, Rachel was talking about the connectivity, but we need to understand how corals reproduce so that a healthy population can reseed 
and allow a, a system like this to recover. So understanding reproduction is fundamental if we want to know how a system is going to change over time. And really that's what was the driving factor for me to start thinking about reproduction and how can we uh, spawn corals in a really planned and predictable ways in the aquariums. So it had never been done before. Um, spawning events had happened in public aquariums, but it had always been unplanned and unpredictable. So what I started doing is looking at what drives a coral to reproduce in the wild. What are the environmental parameters? And what we know is seasonal temperature change, photo period, and then moving up to lunar cycles. All of these factors work at progressively finer scales to trigger the corals to reproduce in very small windows of time. So different species will spawn at different times of the year, but it's very narrow uh, when they're releasing their, their eggs and sperm. And this really, building this system created the platform for lots and lots of opportunity. And so I'm going to just highlight some of these, these projects that we've worked on over the last, the last 10 years. So if you're working with spawning in the wild, you, you're in the water at night, waiting for this coral to spawn, and it's going to spawn in about a half an hour, 45 minute window. They're like pandas, and that's it. They're done for the year, so you need to be in the water at the right time. The power of ex situ is we can manipulate at lots of different temporal scales. So each of these systems have a microprocessor attached to them, a computer. We put data from the location that we're studying into that computer, and we can manipulate that data. So we can shift the coral rather than spawning at, at night, we can make it spawn in the day, which is great for logistics. We can shift the lunar phases to move the time of the month it spawns, or we can manipulate the entire seasonal profile to move it into different times of the year. So this is just highlighting a, um, a study we ran over about three years, focusing on a species called Galaxia fasicularis. This is a new model organism that we're, we're working with. And ultimately what we did is we started looking at how could we manipulate spawning behavior. So on this graph at the bottom, um, zero uh, represents the start of the year. And as you work round the graph, you're going through the year in an anti-clockwise direction. So one of our systems we programmed <coughs> to replicate Australia. So this species comes from Australia, these individuals came from Australia, and normally they spawn in November and December. So there are in sync system, each dot represents a different spawning event uh, or a different spawning output from a colony. So the in sync, in -sync six system is behaving exactly like it should do in the wild. We then phase shifted that and made one spawn four months later. And then we did that again with an eight month cycle. And so the idea behind this, we've got a really small window of time in the wild to collect the eggs and sperm. But if we manipulate that, we can really increase the access to the eggs and sperm. That becomes the material that we can then settle, grow corals for research or for agriculture or for reef restoration practices. So, Kaos University out of Saudi Arabia tasked us um, a couple of years ago to build systems for them uh, with the Coral Spawning Lab. They wanted 24 spawns a year to create the platform to accelerate their research. Um, I'm not going to really talk through these graphs, but each line represents a different spawning output. We finally got the systems built through lockdown. They were built in London and shipped out to Saudi Arabia. And what we've, starting in March last year, we've had 95 spawning events in these systems. So we've, we're 95, or 95 times more output than you would have when you're relying on wild spawning. And from those, that yielded 30 successful fertilization attempts. So we've, we've got 30 times more productivity and access to these gametes for the research output. So this just sort of highlights one power and potential of the ex situ spawning. What we know is once you understand how a coral spawns in the wild, we can apply this same methodology to any coral. So this then led on to another uh, species. So <coughs> The aquarium trade, there's many people have coral tanks in their living rooms at home. It's a multi-million dollar industry. Some of those corals can be fragmented in exactly the same way as you take a cutting from a plant, and they can be grown on the ocean, in the ocean, this cutting, and then sent you know, to wherever they're gonna be and, and ultimately end up in someone's living room. This species, uh, Homophilia australis, is an endemic species from Australia, can't be fragmented in that same way. Um, 
So each individual, this is a single polyp rather than a colonial organism like most corals are, each coral is actually sawn off the reef. So it's a purely extractive process. Now, these uh, represent the adults down the side, or these are the adults down the side. They can come in many different colours and grow or, or, or colour patternings. You get the right colour patterning, these can go up to $6,000 each individual coral. So they're really <laughs> highly valued and highly priced. And that means that there's an intense pressure to go out and collect very specific colour morphs. And the problem has been is that they've been completely over-harvested. So actually now the fishery has crashed. They've closed, the Queensland fishery has now banned the collection of this species. Problem is, no one has ever known how this species reproduces. So this is something that Rachel mentioned that I'm a bit coral <laughs> obsessed. I really wanted to focus on this, and I spawned these in my kitchen. And this creates the blueprint of how can we then do this from an aquaculture perspective. So these um, individuals, not these individuals, but I spawned corals last year. I then was able to then document the reproductive timing, which gives you the first window of time when you need to focus on them. And then this is describing the um, embryological developmental phases of the, of the coral there. So the scanning electron microscope just shows from the moment of spawning right the way through to the planular larvae. This is all happening up in the ocean. They then settle and grow into the juvenile coral. And so by documenting the growth of this provides that blueprint that we can start to look at sustainability. And so I've been working with a company out in Australia where they have taken these ideas and are really building it up in a massive facility. So rather than going from an extraction process, they're looking at a sustainable aquaculture process. You still need to bring your broodstock into, into your systems, but then that allows you to then spawn that same individual multiple years. You're getting hundreds of eggs, thousands of eggs from each individual. And so you can start doing this in a completely different way. You add value to a resource, you provide salary to people, and then if you end up with excess, the idea is this can then come into a restoration setting where you're funding reef restoration but still creating a livelihood. So they've done multiple species, one of which is um, an edge species that Fran's going to talk about in a minute, something called Catalophilia jardinii. It's another species that are sort of documented that reproduction. And so it, it, we're slowly answering some of these reproductive questions of quite difficult species. And then the, the last example I want to give is, is work that we're doing out in Qatar with Qatar University. So the Gulf of Arabia is a really interesting system in the fact that it's the warmest sea that reefs occur in. Um, so within the genetic code of the corals that live there, there are the answers about reef resilience and, and climate change resilience. So it's a really interesting system to study. But it doesn't mean that it's not infallible. So, this is a branching uh, acroperid species. There's seven species of acropora in, in Qatar, but they are all declining. And so there's an urgent need. You can see the three-dimensional structure that's growing. If we lose that, again, we're going back to that two-dimensional structure. So we're focusing on this species uh, over the next five years, um, working in a number of reef locations uh, off, the, off the, uh, the northeast coast and east coast of, of Qatar's waters. For the last couple of years, they've been working with asexual fragmentation, so breaking branches and sticking those onto new donor uh, reef locations. The downside to this is it's just like taking a cutting from a plant, that genetically, the offspring that you produce are all identical to the parent colony. So if the parent colony is going to suffer from climate change, all of those individuals that you're putting out don't have any reef resilience within them. They create the three-dimensional structure quite quickly, which is good, because we want to keep that structure. But what ideally we need to be doing then is complementing that with sexual reproduction. Because each individual that you're producing through a sexual reproduction is genetically different, and some of those will have more climate resilience than others. And this is exactly what we're doing. So this is the example of how we're using asexual fragmentation. Um, now we're using the ex-situ spawning to produce the material for sexual reproduction to increase that genetic, genetic diversity. And so last year we collected brood stock. We did that in um, both April and May. And this picture that you see here, this white cross-section, this is a cross-section of a branch. The red dots in it are the ripe eggs, so we know that that 
colony is going to spawn. So we collected the gametes from that, settled those, and now we're mapping and building up the number of juveniles that we're getting from these events. So within one month, they start creating these fluorescent proteins, which is a bit like their sunscreen, protects them from the harsh, harsh UV rays. Then after three months, they started creating a colonial organism, so rather than one polyp, that's divided, 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 and making a colony. And then within seven months, they're starting to take on some of the characteristic look of the, of the adults. So this is just the first year of working um, with this. Um, we'll be continue doing this year on year now. Um, the idea with this, in the center, we've got the, uh, the ex situ spawning systems. And around the outside, we can also spawn corals in there. So we can actually create three spawning events within this one facility rather than the one spawning event. So hopefully this is sort of giving you some indication of what we can do with, with the ex situ spawning capabilities. Um, there is a huge number of organizations, both um, commercial that have sponsored work, the work over the years and also um, universities that we've worked with. Two of my team for the Horniman Museum are here. These guys work tirelessly every day to run the systems at the Horniman. Um, and I couldn't do it without you, so thank you so much, Matt and Hartley. Um, and then there's other collaborators that have, have helped over the years. There's some information on various uh, web platforms and social media if you want to follow. And from me and my little Acapora <laughs> embryo, thank you very much for listening. I've actually got loads of time because that was bang on time, Jamie. It was amazing. So if, if anybody has an, an urgent question, please go ahead and, and ask it now. Otherwise, we can come back at the end of the session for the panel questions. Quick question over there. Um, definitely. I mean, there's, there's lots of disease issues. So one of the guys that I work with at the Coral Spawning Lab is a, is a global expert in disease. I think uh, more recently, the, probably the most sort of well-known is something called Skittle D. Uh, there's the, they think it originated in um, the Port of Miami, and it's just ripping through the Florida reef tract. It's now spreading through the Caribbean. Um, so colleagues that are working in America are very much focused on that. That disease, literally within about four years, has taken certain populations down to lower than 1%. And so NOAA actually um, gave the green light to actually remove colonies from the wild so to stop the local extinction. They're in a network of aquariums around the US, and using spawning is very much uh, the sort of road to recovery. So I work closely with Florida Aquarium that are very much focused on, on that. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I will come back to you at the end. I, I have questions of my own, but let, let, let's keep going for now. Hold that thought. Um, and yeah, I'd really encourage you to have a look at Jamie's social media channels. Uh, some of the footage of spawning is absolutely fantastic. Really, really gorgeous stuff. Um, our second speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Fran Cabada. Fran's a, a marine ecologist passionate about helping to build capacity for the next generation of conservation leaders. Um, her work focuses on applying multidisciplinary approaches for the conservation of marine biodiversity specifically. And she's currently leading the uh, master's project, uh, the master's program in applied aquatic biology at the University of Portsmouth, but is also still very much involved in uh, our Edge of Existence program here at ZSL and is a, is a valued colleague of many, many years. And it's lovely to see her again. Please welcome Fran to the stage. about the pillar coral, and I'm going to basically advocate why it is important that we start balancing ecosystem approach, as Rachel said at the beginning, with species focus, research, and conservation. So reiterating uh, the importance of coral reef, reef provides a lot of benefits for millions of people globally, through coastal protection, tourism, food, and many other goods and services, some of which have high economic value. When uh, the delivery of these services can be compromised when the functioning of ecosystems of coral reef is altered. That has led, understandably, to what is principally an ecosystem-focused approach 
to monitor coral reef to assess the status of reef and to plan conservation interventions with that focus. Neglecting a little bit the research on populations at the population level for species. As marine heat waves are increasingly frequent and long lasting, affecting even the remotest and best managed reef around the world, we have seen many reef degrading, but also what we tag as recovering, basically because the percentage cover is starting to increase or reaching back to the levels that were before the bleaching. However, we can have, and we have seen this, uh, there's a lot of evidence around the world that even when we achieve in many places the same cover, we have a very different composition of species. Uh, because of a lack of resources in many parts of the world, coral cover is the only information that we have to inform reef conservation. Uh, and this shift in species can also alter ecosystem processes, as has been evidenced for carbon budget, for example, among many others. So to use a familiar analogy, as coral reefs are considered the rainforest of the seas, of the oceans, we are basically seeing how in many reefs, what was an Amazon forest, pristine forest, is becoming a homogeneous plot of trees. And we are making decisions mostly based on the coverage of green, which in fact doesn't change much between the two. This is very important because for rare species, coral species that are uncommon, that we rarely see, they might be going locally extinct and those extinctions are probably going unnoticed because we don't have the information to actually assess how they are and whether they disappear or not. And under the accelerated uh, effects of climate change, these rare species have an increased risk of becoming extinct. So in the next few minutes, uh, I'm going to try to be <laughs> quick. I'm going to tell you the story of the pillar coral because I think it perfectly illustrates not only how knowledge gaps can hinder timely action to try to save local extinctions, but also how increasing the conservation attention, even just by a little bit, can in fact improve the picture and um, push drive the information that is needed to start doing some ex situ and in situ conservation that is targeted and is effective. My story starts in 2012, when the first Edge Coral Species List was published. Edge is a program run by CEDESEL, and it prioritizes species that are evolutionarily distinctive and globally endangered. What that means is that the top species in the list are ones that disproportionately contribute to phylogenetic diversity, in which um, origin conservation action is needed to advert their extinction. Uh, in the top of that list are usually a species that have suffered a strepitous decline in their populations, but also rare species, uncommon species, for which we have very little information for. The pillar coral, uh, Dendroja, I'm sorry, I'm going to spare you the pain of listening to my accent saying pillar <laughs> all over. So I'm going to refer uh, as Dendrogyra. Dendrogyra is one of those, is the only species in its genus, is uncommon, although conspicuous, highly susceptible to diseases and bleaching. Um, and I would argue that it's still poorly known. So the first a species focus in the Androgyra project was seed funded by Edge through its fellowship. Uh, this was the first Androgyra fellow, Nikita, 
uh, in the Bahamas, and she established a uh, citizen science program and assess the occurrence of the species. That was in 2012. Then, in 2013, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission published what was an, a status uh, baseline of the species with a really long list of unknowns and research needs. Because at the time, the species was proposed to be included in the US Endangered Species Act. The distribution range of Dendrogyra includes Florida, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, the Central American Barrier Rift, Major and Minor Antilles, down to the Southern Caribbean in Venezuela. At that time, we're talking 2013, very few reports of the species existed. They were basically mentions in great literature, a few papers, only information about abundance was from San Andres and Providencia on a dissertation, actually in Spanish. Um, no recruits have been recorded since the 884, if I'm not mistaken, except for one in the US Virgin Islands. And then in 2014, based on mostly on that report for the, from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the species was included within the Endangered Species Act. That mobilized a lot of resources in the US to basically fill those knowledge gaps that uh, existed. But it also increased the interest to ample that picture beyond Florida. That's how I got my own <laughs> Edge Fellowship in 2013. I started working in the Dendrogyra in 2014. In my native country, Venezuela, the, sound, the southern edge of the species distribution. I got in, interested in Dendrogyra during a national red listing exercise. And after reviewing all the great literature and peer review published literature on reef in the country, um, scoured through 15 years of monitoring data and talked to all the coral researchers, sounds like a lot, but we were five only <laughs> at that time in the country. Um, Nobody had seen any colony of Dendrogyra, and there was no colony reported since the 80s, except for one colony that were really close to a transect that had been seen spawning in 2013 at Los Roques National Park, which is uh, this little bright spot here off the coast of Venezuela. So I was mentally prepared for my fellowship to record the extinction <laughs> in Venezuela of an edge species. Uh, with 220,000 odd hectares in the MPA, this is a national park, a marine protected area, I needed to be really, really smart about how to survey the most area as possible. So I record to a very useful um, tool to find rare species, and that is basically local ecological knowledge. Um, an important thing here is that Los Roques at that time was one of the best monitored reef in Venezuela. It was monitored for 15 years by both uh, AGRA, which is a regional program, and the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network, which is a global network. 15 years of data, no one single colony recorded inside a transect. I then started making really good relationships, basically, with all the fishers, all the tourist operators, uh, employees, the tourists themselves. I used local ecological knowledge. I started doing some focal groups with maps. And what was surprising for me, because I was a really science-oriented, biased person, <laughs> every fisher knew where to find the dendrogyre. They know where every colony is located. And they know that because, according to them, the caramujo, which is the local, they actually have a local name for the species, is associated with really good fishing sites for spiny lobsters. All the dive um, staff from dive operators also knew where the species were. 
so much so that of all the sites that we survey, and this was 106 sites, 99% of those sites coincided with what the fishers had told me and pointed in the, in the map. We cover increasing our transects, we modify the approach because rare species can actually not be monitored through normal uh, and um, monitoring methods. Uh, so we cover 6.2 square kilometers, which doesn't sound like a lot, um, but it was actually 70% of the reef area above 15 meters in the MPA. And we have actually counted almost 1,500 colonies, and that is the highest abundance ever reported for the species. Most of those colonies at that time, between 2014 and 2016, were in a really good con health condition, very low bleaching, almost no sign of diseases, um, very low um, dead uh, tissue. Obviously, that picture varied along, um, a lot, sorry, among the different reefs, and it truly depended on the zoning of the MPA with higher protected areas having the most abundant um, what, subpopulations and the better health status. Some other things that were uh, really surprising for us was that we recorded dendrogyra in, dif in different habitats, 14 to be precise. So we realized that in good conditions, well-protected areas, that species can be in different habitats, can colonize very different habitats. And we may start looking in places that we before might have not looked at because, oh no, we cannot look uh, at dendrogyra there. So they were in fact more abundant in sand flats dominated by soft corals than in reef terraces within consolidated reef. We always found uh, dendrogyra in Acropora cervicornis thickets, which have disappeared from the rest of the Caribbean, sadly. We saw very, uh, a lot of plasticity in the growth form with actually encrusting colonies, healthy colonies, in high energy environments. And we also recorded several monospecific colonies spawning over 100 square meters, like small monospecific reef that were oases in the middle of what was otherwise a barren sun flat. So we were able to get a lot of information using different methods, but these results also highlighted the need to have a different approach and how little information we're actually getting on rare species when we use normal monitoring methods. So from 2014 up to 2019, that push uh, of resources and interest actually made possible a lot of research, new information, especially on the reproductive biology, which is really important, as Jamie said before, explained before, uh, came to light, as well as population structure and clonality. This allowed to inform active um, conservation interventions and start also paving the way for ex situ and ex situ, uh, in situ programs, some of which are in fact being done in Dominican Republic and Florida. But it also improved our knowledge in what variables we really need to be recording to assess the viability of this population. So abundance is important, but not as um, coral cover. We need to count number of colonies. That is really important, but it's not sufficient. We also need sex proportion. How many female colonies are in relation to male colonies? The distance between those colonies is also really, really important. And the level of clonality, because all those factors influence the reproductive success of wild populations. In 
2019 that mostly Florida Focus research pointed to the fact that the, that wild population might be actually functionally extinct already. This highlights how from 2013, when the first baseline assessment from since the late 80s was published on the wild population, because of the disease, the um, stony coral tissue loss disease, a novel disease that was uh, described in Florida in 2014, how from 2014 to 2019, this disease just wipe out the um, population in Florida, moving then to Yucatan, then eastwards. And sadly, in November, it was recorded in Los Roques, also in Venezuela. However, I know this looks like a gloom outlook, but <laughs> it, it's also full of hope. And it's full of hope because Thanks to that increase in conservation attention, there are ongoing programs focused on the species, not only in Florida, but also in the Dominican Republic. New strongholds have been identified, especially in Cuba. Um, and there was enough information to allow to evaluate and update the extinction risk of these species. And that evaluation came out as a genuine increase in the extinction risk of dendrogyra, moving from vulnerable to critically endangered. So this species needs really um, urgent conservation action. We also need to fill the many geographical gaps that still exist because we require a regional approach to the conservation of these species. And these knowledge gaps and geographical um, gaps are not anything but a representation of the political, economical, and institutional landscape of the species distribution. The good thing is that being on the red list with a genuine change, thanks to that um, information that came from mobilizing resources and increasing the conservation attention, is that the red list known as the barometer of life, actually informs uh, global conservation uh, agendas. And this should reflect in more resources and more interest into the species. I would like to finish by thanking you, but also highlighting that the pillar story should be a precautionary one, and we should start increasing the research at the population level, for, especially for rare coral species. Thank you. Many thanks, Fran. Is there just one quick question before we go? Oh, to sorry. Our, <laughs> our next speaker. Hmm? Nothing immediate. OK, keep thinking. We'll come back to that uh, for our panel. Thank you, that's fantastic. I was, uh, remember diving with Nikita in the Bahamas looking for dendrogyra every day for two weeks. We found one on the last day, and that was it for the entire two weeks' work. But it's a fantastic coral. When you do find them, they're just very, very impressive corals. OK, so our third speaker tonight uh, is Dr. Brian Wilson, a coral biologist from the University of Oxford. Uh, Brian's funded uh, under the Bertarelli Marine Science Programme that, that I manage um, and, and is a fantastic part of our team. Um, his work studies the impacts of climate change uh, on the world's coral reefs using a combination of classical old-fashioned ecology, conservation and cutting-edge genomics. Um, he's currently working on a range of things, including the, the, the horrible coral disease in the Caribbean, um, but also looking at the relative, relatively pristine reefs of the, of the Chagos Archipelago. And his key obsession at the moment is uh, the, what is possibly the world's uh, rarest coral, Tinella Chagius, uh, and seeing how we can save that, hopefully, from the brink of extinction. Thanks, Bri. You're, uh, you're very lucky to have me up on stage here because uh, I tend not to do public appearances after Christmas when I'm at my festively plump. 
But uh, when ZSL calls, uh, you answer. Yeah, this is my personal and professional obsession. It's uh, possibly the world's rarest coral. It's uh, the Chagas brain coral, uh, Tonella Chagas. It's a very special little coral for a number of reasons. One is that, um, uh, like Dendrogyra, it's, uh, it's got no close relatives and, and sits on a little lonely branch of the tree of life all by itself. It's also been absolutely decimated by climate change in the last, uh, the last couple of decades. And uh, it's also only found in one tiny little area of the world, the Chagas Archipelago. And for those of you that uh, don't know where this is, it's uh, one of the world's most remote coral reefs. Uh, oops, oh, where's the, uh, oh, the laser, the top, there you go. Um, about 500 uh, kilometers south of the Maldives. And uh, it's kind of a couple of thousand kilometers to Indonesia in the east here, and about uh, 1,500 kilometers to uh, the Seychelles and Maldives. Oh, sorry, the Seychelles and uh, Mauritius there. And it's 640,000 square kilometers of mostly nothingness. And when this marine protected area was created back in 2010, it essentially doubled the, the marine protected areas around the world. Uh, it's about the size of France. Uh, for any American citizens in the audience, it's about the same size as California. And uh, it's made up of about 58 islands, uh, covering some 50 square kilometers. Of, uh, of terrain above the water. Most of that found here in Diego Garcia, uh, down in the far south. Uh, almost every island, apart from Diego Garcia, has been uninhabited for about half a century. And this truly is a, a jewel in the crown for a, for a marine biologist, because it's one of the few places on the planet where we can actually study the effects of climate change without any of those difficult confounding factors of human interference. Uh, from uh, much closer, it looks a little bit like this. This is uh, Salomon Atoll, one of the northern atolls. And these are the 11 islands that make up this particular area. And as you can see here, this would have been uh, the, the crown of a, a long extinct volcano that we can see there. Now, uh, Rachel's done a great job of uh, explaining that uh, this region is not unique to the, the changes uh, that are ongoing around the world. And, and Catherine, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, did this wonderful work back in uh, 2019, showing that uh, in 2015, 2016, we had this back-to-back -back double bleaching effect, where uh, essentially we had this, these degree heating weeks that, uh, that measure the intensity and duration of, of prolonged periods of heat stress on reefs. And then it, uh, the reefs were hit particularly hard in 2015, and then again in 2016, and there was no recovery whatsoever. And that really, really did affect the reefs here. Now, usually we say that when, uh, when a, a region has four degree heating weeks, it's, it's stressed and it's going to begin bleaching. Here in uh, 2016, we actually got 14 degree heating weeks. This was a really, really serious year for coral reefs around the world. And we lost some 80 to 90% of a huge number of species. These here are the tabula acropora. And actually, the Living Oceans Foundation were actually on a cruise through the Chagas Archipelago just as that bleaching started kicking off and, and managed to get this wonderful footage of these, these corals in this, this kind of mortal state. Tonella, as well, was uh, hit particularly hard. And when I first joined the Bertarelli um, Foundation's program for marine science, I was told that the coral was functionally extinct. Back in 2018, the year before I started, the team had been out diving twice a day for over a month and hadn't seen a single colony. And therefore, it was classed as functionally extinct, which, which Fran has mentioned there. And essentially, what I was told was I might see some corals, but they were on their way out. They weren't going to last much longer. And as it happened, when I actually found my first two colonies up in the Peros Banyas Atoll, up in the far north, they were sorry looking indeed. Fragments, shadows of their former selves. And you can see here where what once was a, a huge colony, there's only a tiny bit of tissue left. Now, there is a chance that if uh, these, these corals are given uh, recovery time, those corals will then grow back over that again. And we have actually seen that in some of the corals we've been looking at uh, over the, the last four years that I've been out there. Now, there are signs of hope. And one of the beautiful things about nature, and corals in particular, is just when you feel like you've got them pegged, they come back and surprise you. And uh, as it happened, I led a tiny little expeditionary team out in uh, 2020 to Diego Garcia, down here. And on the very first dive, when I rolled off the back of the boat, I landed on this beautiful specimen about 40 centimeters across here. And uh, this would likely have been four, five, six years old, and, and certainly reproductively fecund, so it would have been throwing out uh, larvae at uh, the spawning time, which, bizarrely for the, the Chagas Archipelago, we still don't know when corals spawn out there. We have vague ideas, and certainly when I talk with Jamie, we have a, an idea when that might be, but nobody's been out there and actually witnessed the spawning. And uh, it's one of the few reef systems in the world, and I, I don't know if there are any others, where we don't know when the corals spawn. 
Um, it's not just the corals that are hopeful out there. The sharks also um, are, are abundant and uh, pesky. And uh, it does mean that when sampling for corals out in these particular reefs, uh, and sharks are an incredible thing to see as a marine biologist. Uh, there's not many reefs where you can basically have a guaranteed shark on pretty much every single dive. But uh, this particular gray reef uh, just wouldn't leave me alone when I was trying to tip off a little thumbnail of tissue to, to take back to Oxford with me and study. And Later on, I, when I joined the follow-up expedition, uh, a couple of weeks later, I came across what I can describe only, I suppose, as a last haven for this species. Possibly my favorite place on the entire planet, an absolute paradise for a marine biologist, and I think anyone, to be fair. And this is Middle Brother, one of three islands called the Three Brothers, the middle one, bizarrely enough. And uh, it's unique in the archipelago by being the only island that essentially has its own self-contained lagoon. It's a tiny island, about a one and a half kilometers all the way around. To me, it looks like a little, uh, a little love heart. And beautifully, this is a, a little kind of shark nursery that sits in this tidal pool here. Um, the lagoon itself is, again, tiny, uh, probably a kilometer in length. We see these six coral knolls that come up from the seafloor, about 10 meters off the seafloor. And these are absolutely abounding with corals, in particular, Tonella. And when I dived here in 2021 and, and actually counted every single colony I could find, I found 42 colonies. And to the best of my knowledge, this is the single greatest clustering of this, this coral in the world. Because, of course, it's only found in this little archipelago. And as the guys before me have mentioned, the clustering of these corals is very important. Because when these animals, these sex sexually reproducing animals, essentially have to um, increase their, uh, their, their populations. They need to do this by being close to each other. Genetics and evolution and adaptation rely upon mixing. And that's, of course, a really big problem. If you're so rare, the next nearest colony is tens or even hundreds of kilometers away. So this island in particular holds possibly the last hope for this, for this coral. And in fact, I found this beautiful little yearling, a baby coral, showing that actually these corals are breeding and that we are seeing some signs that these, uh, we're seeing generations being brought on now. But of course, again, nature continues to surprise me. And uh, one of my colleagues, and one of the beautiful things about working with this coral is that everybody wants to find it. I think because I might have mentioned buying drinks when we got back to land at some point, and, uh, and yeah, the credit card gets hit pretty hard when we do dock at Diego Garcia there. But the, the, the drinks are subsidized, so it's, and I claim it back from the ground. Um, <laughs> That's a joke, by the way, uh, for anyone uh, at Oxford that's watching this on YouTube later. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues, Nick, actually uh, found in, a, in a, a hitherto unexplored tiny island called Il Paracel, this absolute monster down at 14 meters. This particular colony, the biggest one I've ever seen a picture of, was uh, over a meter in diameter, possibly decades, decades old, if not more. And the great thing about a coral this size is that it would be disproportionately spawning and, and, and essentially adding to the next crop of corals to follow. Not only that, but it clearly would have survived a huge number of the very recent bleaching events. And therefore, this coral may hold some secrets as to why it's managed to survive. So what I'm trying to do now as I go back to the archipelago uh, every year is, is essentially get a real hold on the range and abundance of this coral, which is one of the things we have to find out, of course, to classify how rare and how threatened a species is. And at the moment, I've got confirmed sightings in, in places all over the archipelago here. So Peris Banius up in the north, Salomon here, the brothers I've just mentioned, and Diego Garcia here. I should mention that uh, back in the day, 20, 30 years ago, this was one of the most common corals in the entire archipelago, one of the top 25. And, and Charles Shepard, who's been going there since the 70s, told me about ducking his head below the water and looking out and seeing 50 to 100 of these beautiful underwater brains spread out on the seafloor amongst a bunghing. And, and Rachel, certainly, who's been diving there a lot longer than I have, um, will tell you that it's, you can go days, if not weeks, without seeing a single one of these now. They've been hit disproportionately hard by bleaching, and we're not entirely sure why. We want to know why, or I want to know, uh, why uh, Middle Brother in particular is, is so, uh, such a special site. One of the reasons we think it might be is because it's a lagoon. So one of the things, of course, is when these corals spawn, instead of that spawn being dissipated over huge distances in the oceans, it's trapped within this lagoon. And we think that means they can mix a lot better. Not only that, but lagoons, there's a restricted water flow. And so we find that the water temperature in lagoons is often a lot higher than the surrounding waters. And therefore, it's possible that these corals might be actually pre-adapted to kind of hot water conditions and might actually be surviving these, these new range of conditions we're seeing. 
uh, Rosie, who's here in the audience now, uh, just came back from Expedition, I think, uh, in October, and actually added to this. And uh, we now have uh, sightings in places I've never seen before, which is Nelson Island up here on the, the north of the Great Chagos Bank and Egmont Islands. Um, which is great, because it means that uh, I, I can go to different places in the archipelago and find potentially different strains and versions of these corals. And maybe each of these will have some secret to why they've survived so long. Um, I love this old school uh, children's book map. I don't know where I dug it out, but uh, um, the coral also used to be found much further, much further west inside Amala here, which is the largest submerged bank somewhere in between the Seychelles and Mauritius. Um, it's colored green because it's also the world's largest seagrass meadow, and, uh, which sounds exciting, but for a coral biologist, it's very, very dull. It's uh, essentially just lawns to the horizon with the occasional turtle. And the turtles you have to watch out for because when you're focused on them, it's when the sharks get you. Uh, it's a symbiosis that uh, I haven't published on yet. But... Um, Back uh, about a century ago, uh, corals were actually found in an expedition in 1905, and we actually have corals in the Natural History Museum that were collected inside Amala. And also, um, back in 2010, a colleague of mine, David Bura, in uh, Kenya, uh, took photos of uh, Tutanella in these seagrass meadows in this little island near Mauritius. I was just out there for uh, about a month in, um, in some fairly rough conditions. Uh, back in October, and I didn't see any at all, but I, I should give the caveat that it's an area the size of Belgium, and I probably di dived maybe a ten thousandth of the seafloor in the time I was out there. And of course, if this is the world's rarest coral, I wasn't going to find it on those dives. It would be too easy, and I wouldn't be able to use this selling point to be invited to give these talks. Um, and just for uh, reference, that's where the uh, Chagos Archipelago is. And so one of the things I'm really keen to uh, look into is, is whether larvae can actually survive this distance. It's about 1,500 kilometers from the Chagos Archipelago to uh, Sidamala and, and St. Brandon here. There is actually a, an easterly current as well that does swing things to this direction. So there is a chance that maybe corals have been carried, these larvae, from the Chagos Archipelago to these, uh, these much further western regions. So, of course, uh, being this endangered, it uh, appears on the red list. It's currently uh, listed as endangered, but uh, Fran and I uh, were at a meeting uh, last July where we discussed uh, my findings and, and the, the very limited range that we have this coral, and we've now recommended to the IUCN that it be upgraded to critically endangered, which is, of course, the last step before it falls off the edge entirely. I'm also uh, with Kat, who unfortunately can't be here, uh, part of uh, the Green List, which is a, a very recent development, uh, parallels the Red List. And this is actually looking at ways that we can successfully conserve critically endangered species. And so we're going to be uh, working on that in parallel with my assessment with the Red List. And hopefully we'll be able to come up with some mitigation strategies to save this coral from, from dying out. As Fran has also said, uh, ZSL have focused on this coral as an edge species, again, because it's in a, a little tree branch of its own. There's nothing really close to it, and so if we lose this, we lose a, a very important part of the tree of life. So the ways that I'm going about trying to save this coral with the, the funding that I have from the Bertoretti Foundation, one of the things I'm looking at is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. This area is huge, 640,000 square kilometers, very hard to get to, and there's a lot of sharks. Um, traditionally, we'd use graduate students, but uh, <laughs> they're uh, very expensive, and uh, they have employment rights as well. And uh, interestingly, when I take uh, teams out there, I often ask their blood types. And they think it's a sweet gesture, but it's we're near three days away from the nearest hospital. And I need to know that somebody can donate blood if I need it. Um, that isn't a joke. I mean, that is actually one of the, one of the factors I look for in students. Um, <laughs> Luckily, one of my colleagues uh, here and a good friend of Rachel, uh, David Koenig, uh, led a grant out uh, to the uh, Chagos Archipelago just before Christmas. And they're actually doing one of the first high-resolution scans of the reefs around those islands. And using that, we can actually uh, essentially teach computers to spot these, these corals on these wonderful seascapes. And as you see here, this is a tunnel that uh, one of the guys caught. Um, there's two in that picture. I would offer a beer, but uh, I've been caught out by that before, so I won't. Um, I'm also myself, uh, that's me in my, uh, my uh, beautiful uh, Irish shirt, which uh, was chosen essentially because uh, if our boat sank, I wanted to be the one that we pulled out uh, earliest. Unfortunately, the guy that did the pulling said he was blue-green colorblind, so I'd have been the one that floated past, but I wasn't to know that at the time. I'm looking, uh, again, as Rachel, when she introduced me into the, the genomics of this thing, and I was lucky enough to be awarded uh, a research prize last year uh, to sequence the genome of this coral, and I'm beginning to delve into the recipe for life to find out why it's different and why it's managing to hold on. 
Also, with colleagues at uh, the Natural History Museum, we have these specimens going back uh, almost a century. And, uh, and of course, I hate to see this because that's more Tonella than I've, I've probably seen in my life. And, uh, and of course, back in the day, and I'm not blaming Charles Shepard, who I don't think uses YouTube, so I don't think he'll see this. But uh, I imagine back in the day, he would have been pulling these things up left, right, and center, and, and probably contributing to the problem. I think. But um, using these specimens, we're actually going to go back and see how uh, this coral was surviving back when the climate was very different to the way it is today. Beautifully as well, the guys at the Natural History Museum have very kindly offered uh, to do a, a 3D CAT scan of these corals and actually look down to actually what's inside. One of the great tragedies of, of losing something like a coral, which actually hosts a lot of very, very uh, distinctive and in some cases unique organisms, is if that coral goes extinct, those organisms that rely upon that coral go extinct extinct as well. And so this is something that uh, I'll be working with, with the, uh, the Natural History Museum here in London, and also Naturalis in Leiden in the Netherlands. Uh, Paul Pierce Kelly as well, and we've heard mentioned here, biobanking is the, is the, new, it's the, new, um, it's the new funky thing. It's essentially cryopreserving live tissues so that if we do lose everything in the wild, we have that live record that we can go back to and replant with. And wonderfully, and, and, and very sadly for me, I was out in the, uh, the middle of the Indian Ocean when this was hosted by ZSL here. I'm really sorry I missed this, but it's a really great way of going forward and essentially trying to, to keep these corals uh, alive. Um, oh, and they advertised us as well. Um, and of course, you've seen from uh, Jamie earlier that spawning plays a major proponent of this. And one of the things I'm talking about with Jamie is how we might be able to be out there to, to capture these corals spawning and essentially try and bring some of that spawn back and rear it, hopefully in the Horniman Museum and maybe at Oxford as well. And at some point, have a stock that we might be able to take back should these things finally go extinct. If you're wondering why there's a taser there, it's because I was looking for an image of Jamie. And uh, there was a Jamie Craggs back in 2013 that was, uh, was jailed for smuggling 5,000 tasers in from China. <laughs> and, uh, and all I can say is, is that, uh, that prison does work, clearly, because <laughs> uh, Jamie's doing very well for himself. Um, that is the end of my talk. These are the wonderful people that have supported me with sightings and collections. Of course, the, the Bertarelli Foundation with their incredibly continued generous support of my work. And uh, if there are any questions whatsoever, I'd love to uh, take them. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Is there a, just a quick get us going question before we pull the team back to, for the panel session? Go ahead. So, I mean, it's a great question, and it's a great question. I wasn't sighing because because uh, of the, the, the quality of the question. Um, it's more the fact that um, one of the big issues we have with this species, and it's an, it's an ethical dilemma, it really is. Every time I see one of these corals and, and take a sample, I worry that, that maybe I, I'm giving it a little push towards the edge. At the moment, um, well, finding them is, is the thing to start with. Um, we have in, uh, in Middle Brother, yeah, 42 colonies, but my worry, of course, is that these are very closely related. Um, we have a number of corals from uh, different parts of the archipelago, and uh, these are actually some of the corals I've sequenced with this, this research world that I've had now. One of the things I'll be doing with CAT as well in the, in the coming months is, uh, is using the same population genetics work that she did on Acropora tenuis to look at Tonella as well. But um, Acropora are much better characterized than uh, this, this little species. I've got nothing to go on, uh, which is a double-edged sword, because anything I find is, of course, novel and wonderful. But uh, I've got nothing else to kind of base it on. Um, but yeah, the idea is, of course, is that we'll be able to look and see the connectivity between the different parts of the archipelago. And, uh, and we're, I mean, the wonderful thing about what the foundation does is that it funds so many different aspects of the science of the marine biologists of the area. So uh, one of the, the guys that uh, works on, on the foundation's work is uh, an oceanographer working out at Stanford. And so he has some, some beautiful diagrams showing how the kind of vortices whirl around these islands and carry these lava around the places. And so working with him, we'll actually get an idea of what we might might find in terms of relationships between these. Of course, with the corals that were collected uh, over a century ago, back in 1905, and I think uh, Charles's back in the 1970s, we'll be able to look and see whether, again, those are related to the corals that I'm collecting now, and whether we've seen them evolve and adapt from how the, the climate has changed, obviously, in, uh, in the last century or so. Brilliant. I've got a similar question along the similar oh. lines that I'll get to at some point. Let's have all our speakers back up on stage uh, for our panel session and while they're coming back I'll, I'll just make a couple of points that are relevant I think what's 
so shocking about working with corals is that we've seen such an enormous decline in these species, not just in our lifetimes, but in our, our professional working lifetimes. Just the last few decades has seen a catastrophic loss uh, in the numbers of, of the, the sizes of populations and the distributions. And I think all of us have witnessed that firsthand, which is really, really, um, really affecting. And I think it also demonstrates what the limitations of scuba are um, in terms of trying to find corals uh, over many square kilometers, many hundreds of square kilometers of reef in some cases, when you are limited both in terms of duration and the depth you can dive to, trying to establish the population and distribution of anything is really, really challenging. So that's and worth- And sharks. And there are sharks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, very true. Um, Okay, so I'll open up to questions, please, far away. Ray, go ahead. Thank you. Um, oh, there's sure a microphone. I'll wait for that. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, two sort of questions in one, but they're very similar, I hope. Um, with, with stored material, cryopreservation, um, you would have to have the actual reproductive bits of the coral. You couldn't just store DNA and then hope to resurrect them. I, I, certainly not at the moment. Um, and it troubles me about the biodiversity, about the genetic diversity you can get in that sort of system. Um, and then the other question leaping on from that is, are we at the point now with, say, the brain coral, but probably other species too, where there might be some notion of establishing um, an ex situ population, a biodiverse a genetically diverse ex situ pop of those corals in, in tanks or whatever? Well, um, I can answer. So, yeah, I mean, one of the big issues, of course, is, is the genetic bottleneck. I mean, we just don't have enough specimens to choose from. And, and of course, that, that's the hand we've been dealt with. And so we have to, to look at that. But um, in terms of, yeah, the cryopreservation, uh, Mary Hargadorn, I think that was mentioned earlier, um, has done some fabulous work. And I saw that very recently. She, she's really got a, a, an absolute hold on this now. Um, it's very difficult working with, with rare species. Of course, that's why we're all here, to talk about rare species. Um, we uh, slightly unfairly have, have started picking corals that are much less rare and uh, using those as sacrificial models. And of course, if we can get the system working on those then and, and know that that is going to work, then we can work with this one. It's very difficult to work with because it's such a remote area. Um, it's very difficult to get to. Um, we rely upon military flights. And, and uh, if the military pull us off, which they tend to do at, uh, at the last minute, we're, we're stuck with uh, US food for another two weeks. And, uh, and I become festively plump in the middle of the year. Um, but it's, it's trying to engage in, in an area that remote. Um, and, and I've been speaking with Jamie about how we might be able to bring live colonies back. And we've discussed possibly going through Singapore, I think, which you've done previously. And, and, and yeah, and having Jamie on board is, is absolutely key to the, the success of this project because of the work he's done with spawning. But we still don't actually know when this coral spawns. We don't know how it spawns. We don't know if it's two different genders. Um, we just know nothing, and, and we can so rarely get out there. It's very hard to kind of do this fundamental science to kind of answer these very simple questions in other parts of the world. The, uh, the stakes are so high now with so potentially so few colonies left. Um, a simple accident, which Jamie and I have both experienced many times in shipping corals, can, can result in losing colonies, and, and where you might be looking at in a handful of colonies providing a substantial proportion of the genetic inheritance of that entire species the stakes are really, really high. It's a, yeah, I mean, it's a minefield, and it's a, I do have a real ethical problem with, with um, one of the ways I was chatting with a colleague of mine about this out in the States, and he said, look, if you really think this, and it's, and Franz touched upon this with Dendra Gyra, that if you think it's, it's, it's going anyway, then of course you've got to do everything you can to try and save it, and that's the stage we're at at the moment. Better to have loved and lost. Maybe. Well, that's what I'm, I'm hoping. If that does happen. I mean, just, just to have loved, I think, is my, my thing. <laughs> let's, uh, let's hold, pull the reins back on the, the depression there. Yeah. In terms of uh, looking at uh, Dendrogyra, uh, the example in Florida, where that population has, has gone, to, it's almost extinct um, in, in the wild. And Noah basically gave the green light for places like Florida Aquarium to remove uh, those colonies and distribute them, like I said earlier. Um, one of the things that they've found in Florida, they're now spawning ex situ, and they've, they've closed uh, three now reproductive cycles in three years in a row. Once you bring them out of that stress of that environment, um, what they're finding is, one, the health is improving, and then the consequence of that is their reproductive health is significantly improving. And one of the things we use as a measure is sperm motility. So if a colony is stressed and it spawns, 
if it's not very motile, if it is stressed, the motility of that sperm is massively reduced. And what they found in Florida is actually it's got better and stronger each year that it's maintaining within those systems. The, the point that you're saying about the genetic diversity and, and cryopreservation, there's, there is still big limitations to the cryopreservation. So uh, sperm can be cryopreserved, but eggs cannot at the moment. And so that really limits the opportunity to do in vitro fertilization uh, from cryopreserved gametes. So that has led to uh, people now, and Mary has been leading this, um, cryopreserving the larvae itself. So allowing that fertilization to take place and then cryopreserving it. And she's having reasonably good success with that. It means you can cryopreserve a huge amount of material because you, each individual is ultimately a new, uh, you know, uh, each larvae is a new coral or has the potential to be a new coral. So you can preserve a lot of material uh, from larvae, but not um, eggs and sperm. They're now also working at, at tissue samples from individuals as well take you almost um, whole punches from tissue, and they're having some good success with that as well. So it sort of gets around some of that long-term husbandry. You would still need to grow that out until it's a reproductive size, which, which would take a number of years. And it's interesting the point you're making about actually the captive environment being healthier than the wild environment, which is sort of counterintuitive, because I was going to ask, you know, where, captive, where corals are captive bred you are essentially selecting for strains that are, do well in the aquarium environment and therefore may not be as robust in the wild as some of the ones that weren't as well adapted for the aquarium environment. But actually, you've just flipped that round by the yeah. aquarium environment being the healthy. Yeah. So um, again, Florida Aquarium being an example, they, they've been working with, there's two species of Acropora branching corals in, in the Caribbean, one called Acropora palmata, one called a cropper cervicornis. So cervicornis is a staghorn coral. And what they're finding is the reproduction is breaking down on the, on, uh, on the reef, along the Florida reef tracks. There's an area called Brower County, and they think um, the reproduction is, is not only is the population reducing, but during those spawning times, you need them spawning on the same night. You need them close together, and you need them spawning on the same time, night. Otherwise, what happens is you suffer from sperm dilutions. If, if you're too far apart, the sperm is washed away before the fertilization can take place. So if, if the population is spread out, you need to intervene to, to get right fertilization. What's also now happening is as we create light pollution, and this is a big problem all around the tropics, is we're moving from sodium and, and halogen-based lamps to LED lamps for streetlights. We're pushing the spectrum into the blue spectrum, and that can penetrate into the ocean more and the corals have something called cryptochromes within them, and they, are, they react to the blue wavelength. And so what we think is happening is we're getting more light pollution on the land in that blue spectrum. It confuses the coral when it should spawn. And so you end up with corals, one spawning on one night, one spawning three nights later. And so the opportunity to cross is again lost. When those individuals have been removed from the wild and brought into an ex situ system, we can control that light dark environment and they become synchronous again, which means that you can then spawn from them. I'm sorry, I'm going on a bit here, but um, <laughs> the, and then the offspring that have been produced from that in Florida, what we're now finding is those offspring that are produced ex situ, when they're planted out, they actually then start growing much quicker the wild colonies. So it gives us hope that if you give them that. That, that helping hand to start ex situ, you can actually get them through the, some of these pressures. Thank you. Interestingly as well, um, Charles Shepherd back in the, the day, I think, bought uh, um, 15 or 16 corals from the Chagas Archipelago on, onto one of the beaches there into an aquarium flow through system. And uh, all but one of the corals survived and uh, it was Tonella. And so Tonella seems to be a, a very fragile coral as well. So that might, of course, complicate, complicate our efforts to try and save it, but uh, yeah. Uh, I, just to stress uh, that point, that if you remove the, the individual from the stressful environment, it actually can recover and thrive. What we witnessed in Los Roques in the wild was back in 2012, 2010, 2012, there was a massive bleaching event in the Southern Caribbean. And obviously there were no <laughs> dendrogyras in the monitoring transect, but it really affected almost 80% of the other species. 
So only two years afterwards, we were seeing very healthy colonies of Nandrogyra on those same sites. And the difference between the places that were no tech zones, and mm. it's important to know that the population in Los Roques is a very small one and is very is located, concentrated in one island, the rest of the archipelago. There's nobody living there. And it's really remote, so the access um, is not easy. You could see the difference in the health, uh, healthy colonies on those sites, but also during August, most colonies in the protected areas, the no-take zones, were gravid. So we could see that in the wild. Mm. Interesting. Um, OK, let's have another question then. Go for it. Let's wait for your, uh, your mic. Thank you. I have a question about the spawning machine. Um, sorry, I don't know what to call it. Or, or, or Jamie, as we call it. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, as we know, many marine species have very complex life cycles, and due to technology limitations, we typically study the adult version, and corals is a classic example of something that has, you know, a planula and different life stages. I was wondering, and you showed some beautiful images there, probably from a video microscope, of um, the developing embryos after spawning, and you have a system that manipulates probably temperature to the nth degree. So... Do you ever use that system to study the effect of extreme temperature events on individual life stages of those species and therefore have a better ability to predict the effects of climate change on not just the adult and the spawning event, but actually all the life stages in between? Is that something you guys have done? Yeah, it's not something... Well, the, the system is a, is a tool for generating the material. What you do with that material is completely up to whoever's got that, that tool, I suppose. Um, we have done some thermal resilient work at the Horniman. So Michelle, um, who's my deputy until tomorrow, her last day, she's studying her master's on um, looking at if we, we fed a group of corals different things um, to see whether there's not just a genetic, but there's an, what's called an epigenetic component to it. So depending on what you've experienced through your life, do you have thermal resilience as a result of that rather than just the genetics? So she's done quite a lot of thermal resilient work and stress work based on that. There's certainly been lots of work done on various stages of embryogenesis and larval development and putting future thermal anomalies in to understand what that does. Uh, and that, that's yeah, been done by many groups around the world. Um, so really, it's, it's a tool to provide the material and whatever you want to study with that. You could put the thermal anomaly on the adults themselves during that reproductive cycle if, if that's the chosen question that you're looking at. Thank you. I think just to make a sort of associated point, some work we commissioned for the Climate Cop in Glasgow last year showed sort of quite shockingly um, that on the current business as usual SSP pathway, we're looking at annual severe bleaching in the central Indian Ocean annually by about the mid 30s. So the, the timeline is incredibly short and I think the sort of semantics of, of what effect the temperature changes are gonna have on, on life history is an interesting one, but it's almost overridden by the fact that on, a, on a, an annual mass bleaching cycle, there isn't gonna be any reef very long at all. So it did also show that on more aggressive SSP pathways that that window goes you know, decades into the future. So it's not a hopeless case, but certainly on the trajectory we're on at the moment, um, there, are, there are some sort of quite proximate threats here for, for reefs as a whole. I think to add to that as well, one small glimmer of hope that counters that is as the, the tropics warm, the, the warming of water happens both north and south, and we are seeing range migration as a result of that. So areas that would potentially be algal dominated, um, what there's been evidence to suggest that as it gets warmer, the first thing that needs to come in is the herbivorous fish. They clear out the algae, and then corals are uh, you know, migrating both north and south from their traditional boundaries. Whether that's quick enough, you, you know, you may end up with a dead zone in the centre, but 
but with reefs sort of extending. Um, hi, thanks for those great talks. Um, just a, a couple of questions related to the tropicalization. Um, I worry about that as, as a saving grace because of the light, the light acidification, um, attenuated light acidification, especially where I work down in the, in the sub, subtropical areas where, it's, where the, there is potential area to migrate to, the um, turbidity is much higher, et cetera. So that's, uh, I've seen them migrating, but it doesn't, uh, I don't see much and uh, but um, the corals are a sort of holobiont and with a very complicated um, symbiodinium and microbiological association with them um, in 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 these ex situ situations you know you've got very limited resources for controlling that mm -hmm. um, and and for you know bringing in um, rare species of Symbiodinium with your... Uh, well, how do you um, anticipate that? Do you anticipate that being an issue? And um, what potential ways could you see to get around that? So there is a lot of work on, on uh, the whole biome and, and looking at bacterial inoculations onto settlement substrates and squirting probiotics onto corals, looking at how long that um, inoculation can last. In ex situ systems, I think where this is being used for reef restoration purposes, so Florida and, and we're working in the Maldives and in Qatar, everything is coming from source location. So we wouldn't be advocating mixing from different geographical zones and things like that. Um, we are understanding an awful lot more about water chemistry and how that is moving the microbiome around. So, you know, the systems are designed certainly and the technology from the aquarium industry has advanced so much to give us incredible tools to, to get better and better with our husbandry um, skills and understand what that actually does. There's still massive gaps in knowledge, for sure. You know, understanding when we feed a coral something, what does that do to the whole Um So, but I think there's an awareness that we, we, we're not just focusing on the coral we need to consider all of those aspects um, to make it a robust approach. But that's not to say it's not infallible and there's, there's not techniques and, and things that we need to learn with that. And to add to that as well, I mean, of course, uh, one of the, the very valid points you make there is the fact that you may take one of these coral species from its natural environment and bring it back to an aquarium and then, and then essentially foster an entirely new microbiome with the conditions that you have. And then, of course, your real danger there is reintroducing that coral back into the environment and then causing untold damage. Yep. And so these are all factors that have to be considered when you think about what you're going to do with a rare species, in particular in this, in this case. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very convoluted, complex problem. Probably the most developed is, is Florida's work that they're doing, and there's a huge number of health checks that those corals have to go through before they're allowed to be put into the ocean. And I think they have been working with, in a really robust way, and it provides a framework of how that should be approached in other areas of the world, just because they're so much more advanced in have been doing this for longer. Great, thank you. Uh, any more questions? We've got time for a couple more. So, yeah, go for it. Hello. Um, thank you very much. It's a very interesting talk. I don't know much about corals, but um, one thing, are people still discovering new species of coral? And are there efforts being made to collect as many of these species as possible. It's probably a bit of a simple question. But actually, actually collect them and, and store them or preserve them? Is that, so is that a wry smile from everybody on the panel at that point? Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's I, I don't know, a, a little, um, I, certainly when I talk to colleagues of mine, uh, and we have a colleague, Sebastian, in, in Kaos, that's named a couple of species of fossil opera. And uh, he always laughs because um, he says he's got his entire academic career set out for him. He's got a number of species he's going to discover in the coming decades. They're going to keep him going. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the answer there is that um, we're still 
and try to uncover the, the diversity of corals out there. And, and every year we're finding new species that are, we're using new techniques to describe them. But um, there is, uh, I think it's the, the ARC, isn't it? I think is, is what there's, there's a coral ARC program. I think is it in Australia it was started? Yeah, there's a number, number yeah. of ARCs are being developed. There's Caribbean ARC, there's an Australian ARC in Europe, um, Monaco Aquarium are leading a similar type of uh, program as well to try and bring material into uh, ex situ systems and preserve them. In terms of species, it's probably fair to say that coral taxonomy is an yes. absolute mess. It, um, it tests the concept of species to its limit. Absolutely. And, and so new species being discovered are ones that have been called the same species, but actually we know they're probably completely different because you get that species in the Red Sea and in Australia, it's been called the same thing. And actually, as genetic techniques are getting better and trying to separate them out. Matt in the audience is, is, loves his coral taxonomy and he'd probably be able to answer this better than anyone here. But there are certainly new species being discovered, uh, absolutely. Okay, thank you, that's great. Right, we are almost out of time, I'm afraid, so I'm gonna have to wrap it up there, but the speakers can be cornered after we've finished this evening, um, if you have more questions. Um, thanks again to all of our speakers this evening for a fascinating set of talks. Um, I've heard some of it before, but it's always really, really good to hear from these guys and to all of you for getting involved with the Q&A. Um, please thank them again for their fantastic talks. Uh, and as I said, thank you to our audience for coming out on a horrible evening. Um, it's very, very good of you to do that. Hopefully you've been, you found it interesting. Um, our next science and conservation event will be held completely online um, and live streamed to our YouTube channel. That's in March. And that's all about woodland landscape recovery in the UK. So keep an eye uh, on our what's, uh, what's On page for further updates about that. Please keep listening and subscribing to our ZSL Wild Science podcast. Um, and our latest episode is all about how we can recover nature in our cities by rewilding, reconnecting habitats and restoring rivers, in case you missed our last event. And keep an eye out for our survey. Let us know what you thought about our event, how we can improve. Um, you should have one in your inbox by tomorrow. So thank you again to our speakers, to our audience for coming tonight. Uh, thanks very much and good night. <laughs>